Did the Israelites invent the world's oldest alphabet? While scholars for a hundred years have agreed that the early alphabetic inscriptions were written in a Semitic language, this became an issue with the controversial book written by Douglas Petrovich. And if you like this channel and wish to help out, please hit that subscribe button. It really, really matters. And if you want to help us out financially, please consider becoming a Patreon member or by purchasing my, my most recent book, The Ark of the Covenant in its Egyptian Context, or by supporting us in our recent GoFundMe campaign, where we are trying to gather the funds to write a book on the 10 plagues of the Exodus. Details are listed below in the description. Now, this proposal that Petrovich put forward is actually a rewarming of a proposal originally posited by Hubert Grime. And Grime made the suggestion that the early alphabetic inscriptions that are found in places like Serebid al Qadim were originally written in the Hebrew language. Now, Grime's proposal was never really accepted because Grime dickered a bit with the data and ultimately he was unable to prove that the language was actually Hebrew. But in 2017, Douglas Petrovich published his own book called The World's Oldest Alphabet, where Petrovich makes a series of very, very controversial claims. And those claims are, one, the alphabet was invented by Joseph's son Manasseh, and Joseph lived during Egypt's Middle Kingdom. Two, the early alphabetic inscriptions used Hebrew as the underlying language of the written text. And three, the early alphabetic inscriptions are proof of an early Exodus date. Now, the reception to Petrovich's proposal ranged from between instant acceptance amongst American fundamentalists to almost instant rejection by the academic community. What we're going to do in today's video is examine Petrovich's proposal piece by piece and try to determine if it holds water. We're also going to take a look at uh, some findings that just came out in the last couple months and see how those findings affect his proposal. So let's take his three proposed claims and examine each one of them. One, Petrovich has proposed that Joseph lived during Egypt's Middle Kingdom and was vizier under the Egyptian king Sinwasr III, and that he had the name Sobek M. Hot, and that Joseph's son, Manasseh, was really the Egyptian administrator Hebedet, who was brother of the prince of Rechenu, which is another name for Syria. Petrovich places this claim on the Egyptian etymology for Hebedet. The idea that Hebed is Egyptian that means hated, and because Manasseh was rejected as the son who was to be the heir, that he developed or took on this name Hebedet in adult life, and that the prince of Rechenu was really Ephraim. However, there's actually no proof that Sobek and Hot and Hebedeb were in any way related. We have no documents, nothing to confirm that there's a blood relation between them. 
there is an inscription at Avaris referring to a prince of retinue. But the idea that Sobek and Hot was related to him is sterile conjecture. But even worse is that the full name Hebeded is actually Hebededdim. There's an M on the end. This is an indication of what's called Semitic mimation. This means that Hebeded wasn't actually an Egyptian word, an Egyptian name. It means it's a Semitic name that was brought into Egyptian. This is an important detail because we would not then not expect an Egyptian etymology for Hebedet. So then, what is the etymology of this? Well, it actually comes from a very, very common Semitic word, Eved. Now, difficulty here might be that Eved begins with an ion, and Hebed with a round H. But this isn't actually unusual. We do find that between Semitic languages and Semitic into non-Semitic languages, the ion, which is a fricative, loses its fricativeness and becomes a round H. We see this as Semitic languages are brought into, say, Akkadian. That happens. So, in this particular case, we can, we can see that the etymology of Hebedet actually comes from the word Eved which means servant. But this also further raises the question of the etymology of Joseph's Egyptian name. The scriptures tell us that the name of Joseph was Zaphanath Pa'ank, Pa'ank being a recognizable Egyptian form meaning the living one the one who lives, pa, the, ank, life or living. Sobek M. Hot is not a good equivalence for Zaphanath pa, ank. The two are in no way etymologically connected. So I think if the scriptures tell us that Joseph's Egyptian name was Zaphanoth Pa'ank, then his Egyptian name, as we find it in Egyptian texts, should be something similar to that, not Sobek and Hot. There is no etymological connection between the two. Essentially, what Petrovich has done is he's plucked two names out of history and tied them together without any reasonable connection. And I think that's a problem for the first part of his hypothesis, his first claim. His second claim, whether the early alphabetic inscriptions were Hebrew. Like Grime, I think Petrovich fails to establish his case here. Semitic languages are very similar. It is virtually impossible to differentiate one archaic Semitic language from another. And every unique instance of Hebrew vocabulary that Petrovich has offered has been found in other Semitic languages. And ultimately, nobody contests that the early alphabetic inscriptions were Semitic. The problem is showing that they're Hebrew and distinctly. But this problem is further aggravated by the fact that Petrovich does not rely upon linguistic arguments to make his case that the early alphabetic inscriptions were Hebrew. In fact, he relies almost entirely on historical arguments. For example, at the end of his book, he gives three reasons why these texts should be considered Hebrew. 
And those reasons are, one, the presence of the word Hebrews in Sinai 115. Two, that each early alphabetic letter has an Egyptian exemplar, basically a prototype from Egyptian. And three, that, the, that there's a presence of three biblical figures who have names used of only one person found in the Bible. Now, one of the things you might notice is that none of these reasons have to actually do with Hebrew as a language. And we even know that names from Hebrew can be found in other languages, like Aramaic, like other forms of Canaanite. So, the fact that he doesn't actually establish that the language is Hebrew, I think is very, very deeply problematic. So, ultimately, the problem is that in order to prove his thesis, Petrovich is throwing out red herrings that sort of take away, divert from the linguistic argument into more into more conclusions that are readily agreeable, even on its, uh, on its face, even though under certain examinations they aren't. But the red herrings are meant to act as a conclusion. This is what's in logic we call a logically necessary connection. When you have a syllogism, when you make an argument, the conclusion has to follow from the premises. And Petrovich hasn't done this here. His premises do not lend to the support of the conclusion. And the conclusion doesn't follow from the premises. So that's really... It's really hard to say he's made his case here. Now, his third contentious claim, which is that the early alphabetic inscriptions are proof of an exodus. Here is where Petrovich's argument really goes off the rails. And the reason it goes off the rails is because Petrovich resorts to circular reasoning. Now, how he does this circular reasoning is almost hard to fathom. Because it just seems so obvious it's circular. Like, for example, he will say... And I quote, if the Ahisamic of 375a is the same man as the lone biblical personage of that name, and quote, two, quote, the significance of Sinai 375a to the present study cannot be understated due to its identification of an obscure biblical figure, Ahisamic, of this later date in an historical context, end quote. The problem is, those two statements are not actually connected by an identification of Ahisamic in, of the biblical text, in the text. So he has the if, and then just goes, well, it is. If A, A. That's circular reasoning. That's classical circular reasoning. You are begging, literally begging the question. You are basically assuming the conclusion you're concluding. But he doesn't quite stop there. He goes on with a second instance of circular reasoning. He then assumes that... Uh, he then assumes an early Exodus date view. So for him, 1446 is the date of the Exodus. He then dates Sinai 375a, stating that it is 30 years older than the Exodus. So, he dates Sinai 375a to about 1480 BC, and then claims that this is proof, this dating is proof of an early Exodus date. What Petrovich has essentially done is he's Assume the date of the Exodus, 
dated the stila according to that date, and then claims that date is the proof of the early exodus. It's classical circular reasoning. You can't assume what you're going to prove in what you're going to prove. It doesn't make logical sense. But there's more problems with Petrovich's proposal. And very, very quickly, other matters emerge, such as methodology. One of the problems with his book and his proposal is statistical sample size. Now, there are hundreds of early alphabetic inscriptions from the Sinai, and dozens more from the Levant and into Mesopotamia. The problem is, Petrovich has only selected 16 inscriptions to base his entire hypothesis. That's a shockingly small sample size, and it really, really smacks of cherry-picking and confirmation bias. But there's another problem with his view also as far as methodology is concerned. Petrovich describes his epigraphic method as taking publication photos, that is, photos that have been published in a book, magnifying those photos to 400% in Microsoft PowerPoint, and then tracing over the magnified image. Now, the problem with this methodology is that publication photos are downsampled. That means the resolution is reduced for publication. So what's happening is he's taking low-resolution photographs, blowing them up by 400%, and then tracing over the blur. This would make the images so blurry that essentially Mr. Magoo can see whatever he wants in them. This is a method that no modern epigrapher would recognize. Moreover, the translations that Petrovich proposes are idiosyncratic. And Petrovich has even admitted in his book that he has had to forego the normal rules of Hebrew to read some of the Hebrew names in these texts. Well, this raises the question that if he is not reading according to the rules of Hebrew, is he reading Hebrew? This makes his translations more akin to the early translations of the Ebla texts, where the translator scanned through the letters looking for biblical names he recognized, not actually doing proper scholarly translations. But given these problems, is it possible that the Hebrews still could have invented the Hebrew alphabet even if Petrovich couldn't prove his case? Well, just a few months ago, an important discovery came out of Um El Mara in Syria. A early alphabetic inscription was excavated in situ, that means dug up in its original archaeological context, from a tomb that dates to the early Bronze Age. This pushes back the invention of the early alphabetic inscriptions to 2450 to 2300 BC, hundreds of years before Joseph came to Egypt. So, while the early alphabetic inscriptions may have originated with other ancient Near Eastern writing, this actually bolsters the claim that Moses could have written the Torah in an alphabetic text, because the alphabetic text would have been around for a thousand years before Moses. 
But what this discovery also does to the claim that the Israelites invented the alphabet for Hebrew is it makes that proposal dead in the water. There is no way that the Hebrews could have invented the alphabet if the alphabet was invented elsewhere hundreds of years prior. So where does this leave the early alphabetic inscriptions? Even with Petrovich's sloppy epigraphy, selective data, and faulty reasoning, could these inscriptions still have been Hebrew? If one properly considers the epigraphy at Serebi al Qadam, it is a clear that the early alphabetic inscriptions had more letters than what we find in Hebrew. The stele do not mention the people that we find in the Bible, which, if there is interest, a future video might be done to walk through some of these inscriptions line by line. In short, scholars aren't really sure what language the early alphabetic inscriptions were written in. However, it is highly unlikely that that language was Hebrew. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed this video and you found it interesting and educational. Thank you very much for watching, and I will see you next time on Ancient Egypt and the Bible.